As you talked about how you'll be gradual in your approach in terms of rate rises, that essentially means if you need to pause, you'll pause. If you need to raise 50, you'd do that as well. Give us a sense of the conditions needed for those two scenarios. Sure. First, it's, it's gradual and measured, right? Gradual meaning that we don't see the need to undertake aggressive rate hikes at each meeting because the economic circumstances and conditions in Thailand are different from those in the industrial countries. Measured means we'll calibrate our response to the economic conditions, so we'll be data-driven. And so if we see uh, the economic conditions warrant that we pause, we will pause, and if we see that it warrants a, a larger hike, say a 50 basis point hike, we will do so. Data-driven. Inflation still hanging at 14-year highs, and we have a Fed who may move 75. Right. Some say you're behind the curve. You say you're not. Why not? Right. Uh, let me address the behind the curve point first, because I think that it gets a lot of, uh, I think, uh, unfair and unwarranted attention. First off, we're at a very different part of the economic cycle compared to other countries. So um, uh, we, the recovery has lagged both of other countries. If you look at the countries that hiked, all the other countries that hiked, hiked when they, the, their level of GDP economic activity reached their pre-COVID levels. Of all these countries, we're the only one, the only country that started hiking before we reached pre-COVID levels. We don't anticipate for us getting back to pre-COVID until probably end of this year or beginning of next year. So in that sense, it, it kind of shows you that we're not behind the curve. In the sense, we might be ahead of the curve compared to our peers. And that reflects, again, the fact that the economic conditions, the recovery is a bit slower than other places. The other thing that, that uh, uh, argues for a more gradual and measured approach is the nature of inflation. As you actually write, the level, uh, you know, the headline number of inflation is very high. It's uncomfortably high. Seven plus percent in our target range is one to three percent. But I think it's important to get kind of underneath the numbers and look at that will, um, the nature of inflation. And the first thing that we see is that it's almost all, actually not almost, it's all supply side driven, mostly in the food and energy space. We don't see any signs of demand side inflationary pressures. So it's very different from, again, the context in the US and the UK and all those other countries. And we also see that there's a relatively low chance in Thailand, for reasons we can discuss if you'd like, of there being a wage price spiral in Thailand. So I think, and, and if you look at the trajectory that we have um, for headline inflation, we see headline inflation, yes, remaining elevated now, peaking probably sometime in Q3, and then gradually coming back in the target range, perhaps by the middle of uh, next year. There are lots of uncertainty still out there, and you only have two meetings left to the year. Uh, the question really is, is it logical for you to move 25 for the next two meetings, given where inflation is right now? We will be measured and calibrated. If it looks like we need to do more, we will do more. If it looks like we need to pause, we will, we will pause. But again, in the overall context, if you look at where we are, the economic conditions, the structural features. As it stands economy. now, 25 for the next two meetings? It would be prudent for me to comment or prejudge what the MPC is going to do. I'll go back and say that our, our baseline expectation, guiding our policy normalization, it will be gradual and measured. Governor, I mean, it's interesting you say that you're not seeing any demand side inflation and it's all from the supply side. You know, you can't do a lot about supply side inflation. So, you know, one part of my question is why move at all? The second part would be is it really about the currency than anything else and uh, also preempting changes to the structure of inflation there in Thailand? Uh, by currency, you mean like exchange rate pass through in terms of headline inflation? I'll, I'll take that that's the your question. Um, if you look actually in, in, in Thailand, the effect of exchange rates on headline inflation has traditionally been very, very low. Um, past episodes, each like one percentage point in depreciating the exchange rate results in ballpark about six, seven basis point hike in, in headline inflation. So the exchange rate pass-through effect on headline inflation in Thailand is very, very low. It's a very different context, again, from, say, some of the Latin American countries where you see much higher impact of, of the exchange rate on, on inflation. I, I'm afraid I, I missed the first part of your question. It got a bit garbled. Could you run that by me again? Okay. Uh, Governor, I, what I was asking was whether it was prudent to be raising rates when you see no evidence of demand-side inflation and there's nothing really you can do with monetary policy with regards to the other side of the equation, which is supply-side price rises. Right, right. I mean, that's again the reason that we feel that a, a measured and gradual, a gradual approach is appropriate because the source of the inflation is, is supply-side stuff, which raising rates you know, it doesn't do a whole lot in terms of what happens with energy prices. So um, until we see, again, you know, um, clearer signs of demand-side inflationary pressure or we see signs of perhaps a, 
an incipient uh, you know, wage price spiral happening, then we're happy to continue with a gradual and measured approach. But if, again, if the circumstances change and it warrants a more active approach, more aggressive approach, uh, we, we, we are ready to do so. So you say what's needed to contain inflation. What are you prepared to do? What are the policy options? What are the key ones for you to contain inflation? Oh, like any central bank, the main instrument we have is, the, is interest rates. But again, the interest rate works through the channels, usually hitting on the interest rate sensitive sectors, things like you know housing and whatnot, right? But those aren't the things in Thailand that are driving the headline uh, um, uh, inflation. So again, that, that accounts again for why we feel a, a, more, a, more, a more measured approach is appropriate relative to the circumstances that you see in the other countries. The bond has recovered significantly from its weakness. I mean, now some say that perhaps it is overvalued by, by about 3%. What's your take on that? And what's fair value for the currency, given the fundamentals, mm -hmm. given the fundamentals that we're seeing right now? Yeah, my take on that is very simple, Hans Linda. It's that it, it shows you that the, the movements of the bot, like with many other Asian currencies, is driven first and foremost by what happens with the dollar, right? Uh, you know, people were talking about how, oh, you know, there's this huge interest rate differential between the, the Thailand and the U.S. that's causing capital outflows and causing the bot to depreciate. That, that has... But at this level, is the bot reflecting the fundamentals of the country? Uh, this is an economy that's growing at the weakest level in all of Southeast Asia when, uh, prior to COVID, it was among the fastest growing. Mm -hmm. Our, we have a managed floating exchange rate regime system in place, so we don't have a predetermined or target level for the bot. We just uh, want the bot to move in line with market forces. The only thing that we do, the managed part of that floating equation, is that we don't like the um, movements to occur too rapidly because uh, the, obviously the real economy, particularly SME sectors, need time to adjust. The optimism on the recovery of the economy hinges a lot on tourism, which accounts for almost 15% of GDP. A lot of that depends on China uh, and, and Chinese uh, tourists coming back to the country because it accounts for 30% of uh, GDP. I'm just wondering how realistic is that given that China continues uh, to observe its COVID-0 policy, there is risk yeah. to the growth projection. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no question that uh, our economic recovery is tied so much to the recovery in tourism. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, tourism it's, it accounts for about 12% of GDP, 20% of employment. Um, and China traditionally was a big part of that, about a third of our tourists who came from China. That said, um, we don't expect us to get back to the pre-COVID levels of 40 million tourists anytime soon. To get to that level, we would expect a lot of Chinese tourists to come in. But we're operating off such a low base, says Linda, right, um, that, that you know, we went from 40 million tourists pre-COVID to 400,000 last year. You know, this year, year to date, we've seen 3.2 million. Um, full year this year, we expect something north of 8 million. Um, so. You know, that's still a ways to go, and, and we're fairly confident we can get the 8 million figure even without uh, a significant opening of, of China. Would you say that the risk is the downside, though? Uh, this is an economy dependent yeah. on exports, depending on tourism, yeah. and of course we're seeing uh, the situation in Europe, yeah. a recession is coming. Yeah. Uh, we could see the same in the U.S. Yeah. Surely yeah. Thailand will be impacted. There, there are a lot of risks out there, but I would argue that our, our recovery is fairly resilient because we're depending a lot on, tour, on the tourism uh, uptick. Provided, provided there's no like new monster variant that comes out and prevents the recovery in tourism from happening, we feel that the recovery in tourism it's operating off such a low base that we'll see some tourists come. And traditionally, we see that even if when the economy is not doing too well, the tourists still come on a bilateral basis. You see that so like in resource countries, the economy is not doing it, the tourists still come. And I think it partly reflects that you know we're a cost-effective, good value for money destination, so people still come. And so we, we expect, again, I mean, 8 million off compared to what we used to get, uh, 40 million is, 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 is still a long way. And so we're fairly comfortable that we can reach that, reach e that level. EM currencies like the baht are susceptible to movements in the dollar. Do you yeah. see the king dollar, the strength in the dollar persisting? Yeah. Hard to say. <laughs> I mean, if you do, were to hazard a guess, how do you see the dollar moving? Uh, uh, if you ask me about the balance of risk now uh, going forward, uh, probably more towards the dollar uh, uh, having reached close to its peak. To, I mean, the upside of the dollar is probably less relative now to the downside of the dollar. Uh, I think once the, um, the narrative in the United States changes, once people start to see maybe inflation hitting a peak and whatnot, the sentiment will change and the dollar will move, adjust accordingly. How 
closely are you watching Jackson Hole, the expectations that uh, the Fed yep. will remain hawkish, may move 75. How closely are you watching? Obviously very closely, as I mentioned, because the main thing that has been driving the bot has been the movements in the dollar and the Fed's uh, uh, tone, hawkish, and the sentiment on an outlook on inflation and GDP are major drivers of that. And as you mentioned, we're a small open economy, so movements in exchange rate hit us a lot. Do you see Powell moving 75 in September? Is there a case for him to move to be that aggressive as the Central Bank governor who sits here watching very closely on uh, his I, movements? I, I, have, I have enough trouble getting my own forecast here, right? Much less those in the U.S. I'll leave that question for others. Okay, just one final question. Uh, digital currency, uh, of course, uh, CBDC. Uh, you'll be testing uh, the CBDC later this year, and I'm wondering how you expect that to, uh, to play out. Yeah, we, we've been operating or, or doing experiments in the CBD space for quite some time, um, particularly starting with the wholesale CBDC space, where actually has led, I think, there's much more potential in the near term on the wholesale space. I know the retail space. CBDC gets a lot more attention, but um, uh, I think that, that probably is a ways off. We'll be doing a limited-scale pilot uh, end of this year, running for about uh, um, um, six months um, uh, to learn. It's a pilot to learn, not necessarily a pilot to launch, so we want to understand the technology, all the different kind of business and policy implications involved around that. Um, but uh, I have to say that you know we're not in a pressure uh, under any real pressure to quickly launch a retail CBDC. Uh, part of the reason is because our existing payment system, uh, prompt pay, fast payment system, uh, works really quite well. So um, there isn't a pressing need to put in place this new infrastructure to to, to address any. any when discount. might you launch? I I think like any central bank, if you ask them, with the exception again of China, which is rolling out a, a large scale pilot in three years. I would be surprised to see any major central bank launch retail CBDC within the next five years.